All right, so we're going to start Matthew 6, verse 1. Anyone want to read it? No? Okay, I'll do it. Um, Giving to the needy. Be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. So when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets to be honored by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing as, so that your giving may be in secret. Then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. So what Aaron did today was actually evil. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'll get into that. Um, um, Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think they'll be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. This, then, is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Um, For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. When you fast, do not look somber as the hypocrites do, for they disfigure their faces to show others they are fasting. Truly I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face, so that it will not be obvious to others that you are fasting, but only to your Father who is unseen, and your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. All right, so last week um, we looked at uh, four different interpersonal situations and how we're supposed to act in each one. And this time we'll see some other situations that are also related to each other. Uh, Jesus isn't just going through a list of things to do and not to do. All these things that he addresses are related to each other um, in in each section. um, And all the things that he's talking about are present in the Jews' everyday life. And so here we see Jesus, he's addressing giving to the needy, or generosity, um, or almsgiving, Uh, which I know that's what we all call it now, almsgiving, Um, prayer and fasting. Uh, So I know I talked a lot about. So giving to the needy, prayer and fasting. Um, And these topics flow directly out of chapter five and that that ends with, at chapter five, before he goes into this, he ends with, be perfect therefore as your heavenly father is perfect. So in this section, he's explaining how to be perfect or how to be righteous, true righteousness. And to the Jews... Generosity, prayer, and fasting were considered to be like the three great pillars of religious life. So much so, in fact, that the Jews used the same word for righteousness that they did for almsgiving. And the word was tzedakah. Um, and it was the same word for righteousness and almsgiving. So to be perfect, as your heavenly Father is perfect, to truly be righteous, we have to be righteous on the inside. And this righteousness isn't based on what other people can see or what other people think, but rather on our motives, what motivates us, or, or, or how we would refer to, based on our heart, right? We must have the heart of the Father. But Jesus isn't, if you notice, Jesus isn't just talking about motive here. He's also talking about reward. Jesus never hesitates to speak of reward and punishment. And he explicitly states in this passage that the right kind of generosity, the right kind of prayer, and the right kind of fasting will all have their reward. That's what he ends with. But when Jesus speaks of reward, he never speaks in terms, just so we can get straight, he he never speaks in terms of material reward. Um, Jesus um, talks about, like, we might, and let me just... We can be rewarded on earth for our faithfulness. We can be rewarded on earth for our faithfulness. Um, but we have to think in terms of the eternal. I think rewards in heaven. Um, and this is far better because they're eternal rewards or your eternal reward is what Jafar says when he almost stabs Aladdin just like that. Um, 
I watch a lot of kid movies, got a lot of kid, kid quotes. Um, and we have to make sure we understand this. So he's talking about eternal reward or things that, that can't be seen. And, and sometimes they might be things that can be seen, but we can't always think in terms of like prosperity because like in the Old Testament, this is really how they saw it. But for the most part in the Old Testament, prosperity was tied with righteousness. Uh, the number of children you had was tied with righteousness. Um, the harvest tied with righteousness. Like everything was tied in with righteousness. And so, I mean, we see this happen um, in the book of Job. When Job is down and out, if you've ever taken the time to read the book of Job or do an entire book on the study of Job, um, if you're ever just like, I want to get down, read a Job. So when he's down and out, his friends come to talk to him to try to cheer him up. And they basically say, well, this is obviously your fault. You obviously have some kind of hidden sin right? Which is what we all think when someone goes bad for someone. You think in your heart, well, you obviously did something wrong. I'm just kidding. I hope you don't. But so, and, and they say, uh, I'm not, I was going to read a verse, but you just got to trust me on that. If you read it, his friends are all like, well, obviously there's something going on. Obviously, have you ever seen a righteous person punished? No. So obviously you're doing something wrong. If you were truly righteous, then surely this wouldn't happen to you, showing that they believe, hey, good fortune comes with righteousness. And Job denies the charge. And we know that it's true, that he's a righteous man. So we can't tie together good things happening to you in righteousness. And, and I know that like, I'm probably explaining something like, oh yeah, of course not. We all know that's not true, that if you follow God, only good things happen to you. We know that's not true. Well, that's like an ancient way of thinking. How silly is that? How silly is that that people would believe something like that, right? But, that, but in our hearts, we do still kind of believe this, if you think about it. Because when something bad happens to someone, and this happens often, something bad happens to someone, say someone gets cancer. When people talk to me about it or they tell me about it, when, when I was at work or stuff, they'd always be like, and I don't understand why this would happen because he's such a good man. I don't understand why this bad thing would happen to a good person. And that kind of proves that since we believe the inverse, we do in our hearts still believe if we think bad things should only happen to bad people and we can't understand when it happens to a good person, then obviously we also believe kind of in our hearts that good things happen to good people. Bad things happen to bad people. But we know that's not true, right? How many of us sit there and wish bad things happen upon bad people? <laughs> Craig's the only honest person there. He's like, me every day, right? But we do, we still kind of believe this, right? Uh, but God's rewards are eternal. And we may not see them in this life. We may, but we may not. But the same goes for punishment. The same goes for punishment. We may not see punishment in this life. And we may not get to see, <laughs> I said that, we may not get to see other people punished in this life. And we see that happen in the Bible. I mean, they're honest in the Bible. We see people constantly crying out like, Lord, how long will the wicked prosper? How long will the wicked prosper? How long are you going to let this happen? How long are you going to let that guy who acts like that prosper, right? Because you know when, he's, when David's like writing this, he's like, he's got a name. He's got a face for the wicked who are prospering, right? Maybe he's talking about Saul, right? He, he, and so um, this kind of, some are even tempted to do as the wicked do. Because they're like, I mean, it's like, well, they're not, nothing's happening to them, right? We see it in the Bible. Someone says, Lord, like I, I was, and he's actually like, forgive me, Lord, for I thought for a time, why not do as they do? Because the Lord's not punishing them. Why not do as they do? And sometimes, you know, we kind of think the same thing, right? I mean, I, I, you see this a lot in teenagers and kids, like, they're like, why not? I don't understand. I don't understand why I can't do that. They're doing it. They're prospering. They're getting away with it. Why is God not, I'm, I'm not seeing this happening. So we have to get in our heads this reward and punishment that Jesus is speaking of. I mean, and it can, it can be in this life. I mean, you do reap what you sow, and I've seen the results of that in good and bad. But also, it can be something eternal where you, you don't see it in this life. And you may wonder, like, man, what is it going to happen? Like, it's not just like, oh, you're good. You're going to live a blessed life. I mean, you can tell people all day to live a blessed life. It doesn't mean that only good things are going to happen to us, okay? In fact, 
often a faithful servant of God, someone who is righteousness, as reward in this life, God will give him or her more responsibility, right? Like if you're serving God, God's like, that's awesome. You're faithful in all things. Let me give you something bigger, right? More work to do because you're building the kingdom, building the kingdom of God. So now that we've thoroughly defined reward, let's look what Jesus says about motive and reward concerning generosity. Jesus says, be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. So when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets, as the hypocrites do, to be honored by others, they have received their reward in full. Rather, do it in secret. He even says, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. This is almost as if to say, don't even let yourself know what you're doing. Don't dwell on it too long. Don't think about it too long. Don't start patting yourself in the back. It, don't let it puff you up with pride. It shouldn't be that big of a deal because you're just doing what I asked you to do. Don't think about it so much. And, and now most good things begin with the right attitude. Um, and Jesus isn't saying that everyone here was giving falsely or with selfish intent. But often, which we've probably all seen in our lives, what is meant for good is twisted or can be twisted for personal gain. The blowing of trumpets was meant to call all, all, all the beggars, the licensed beggars, uh, to, to like the temple or wherever so that they, they're like, hey, we're giving out alms now. Come get it, right? But wouldn't it be nice if you're standing up on the steps when the trumpets are blown, right? You're like, yeah, from me, right? So, so it wasn't, so what, and in Jerusalem, when someone's giving out money, everyone's like, it's not just like, oh, what a nice guy. That guy's so nice. It was, look how holy they are. Look how righteous they are, right? There were like huge connotations. It was like, this person is absolutely amazing. Look at their obedience to God. But really for some, Jesus was saying, they're just doing it to be seen. They're just doing it from, for the prestige. And this word that Jesus uses to describe them, hypocrites, is the same word in the Greek for actor, someone who wears a mask. God sees through the heart. God sees our intent. And he says that they have received their reward in full. And the word he uses here in the Greek is a verb that's a technical business term for receiving payment in full. It's almost just as if Jesus is saying, okay, you want an impersonal business transaction where you do something good and get something in return, then here is your receipt. Paid in full. You can have, that's what you get. So as we look at our motives, what motives might we have to give? We might give because we have to, right? I think that's kind of the benefit of passing a bucket around because people see and you feel like you might have to, right? Or we, or we might be raised to think it's our sense of duty. It's our sense of duty. Our heart's not really in it, right? We're just doing what's expected. And when we do like this, when we, when we, we give as a sense of duty or because we have to, there's a care, careful calculation of cost and reward. What can I give? What can I give up that, I, that I, like, I'll also get something in return or like this will work out? We only give what we feel we must. When you're giving out of duty, you only give what you feel you must. And when we give like that, we rarely give of ourselves. And sometimes as Christians... Today, we like to throw money at something. It's a lot easier to, to get maybe donations for something than to get people to actually spend time doing something, actually getting their hands dirty, actually building relationship with people. It's, it's a rare find to find Christians who are willing to get their hands dirty. Another reason we might give, we might give out of the, mo the motive of reputation, right? Right? I think this has become more prevalent in the church as we adopt a business model. Um, I think we see this often. Um, there, this is like, um, 
There's a new cause. I don't know if you know some businesses. There'll be a new cause, a new, a new thing. It's like, hey, this is the new big thing everyone's given to. And all the corporations and all the businesses like start backing it and like, yeah, we do this and putting their thing on their site. And like, we're behind this, right? And churches follow. And a lot of times they don't even know what it's about, really. They don't even look into it. They're just like, this is what everyone's given to. We want to get on, get, get on that goodwill wagon. And so we're going to give to it and we're going to promote it and be in the good graces of society. And really, I, that's what business do. And, and why do businesses do that? Because they're selling themselves to people. I mean, and that's, that's what they're doing, right? They're trying to get goodwill from people. They're trying to build a brand that people have positive feelings about. They're selling themselves to the people. That's what they do. And that, that's, I mean, I'm not coming down on businesses. That's, that's what it's about, right? But when churches do the same thing, when we give and trumpet our good deeds to get goodwill or good reputation, is that kind of like blowing the trumpet? When Jesus told us not to announce our good deeds. Look how many we fed. Look how many we fed. Look how much we gave. Look what we did. And when churches are doing that, are, are, or when we do it, are we doing it for Jesus or, or for the prestige? Are we building the kingdom of God or are we building a brand? Because that's what corporations are doing. And honestly, when we look at it, we can't possibly be building the kingdom of God by doing things Christ forbade us from doing. You cannot, you're not building the kingdom of God if you're doing it in a way that's opposite of what Jesus said to do. Another motive for why we might give is because we absolutely have to. Because we see a need and we have to fill it. Because we feel a responsibility for the lost. Because love won't let us say no. We see someone who's downtrodden and we can't help but reach out. We, see an, we, we can't turn our backs on someone or something. We can't walk away. We immediately see a need and we take on this responsibility for it because the love of Christ compels us and we do it for no other reason than to please him. I mean, that, that's what tithes are. It's not, if you're, if, if you're tithing because like, I have to do this, like, that's not what it's about. It's about, man, Lord, I'm giving you, I'm giving you the 10% that is yours, that is the first fruits. I'm, I'm giving it to you. In fact, the first sin, the first murder came over tithe and God being displeased with Cain's tithe because it wasn't from his heart. And that's the other way we can give, to please him, to obey him because our hearts are like his. We take on the responsibility for those that are in need. And when God tells his people to take care of the needy, this is what he wanted. This is what he still wants. I mean, all of this has been about our hearts being into it. Our hearts wanting to please him, wanting to obey him, not doing something, all of anything, not doing something because we have to. Ugh, it says it. Or doing something because we want to look good. And this continues into prayer. And honestly, if only we lived in a time where you gained respect and affluence by giving to the poor, praying, and fasting, right? If you're like, you're like, man, that guy is so popular in school. Oh my goodness. Have you seen the way he prays and fasts? It's like crazy. He's like sold out for Jesus, right? He's got like five WWJD bracelets over here. And then he's got the he would love first on here. Question, answer. Oh, that guy right? But even though we don't see this in society, I mean, we, we can see this in the church a little bit, right? Prestige for, for like, um, and, and we do. I mean, I mean, and there are some people like, I, I don't, I, I think we have a lot of really good prayer people, um, but we're all prayer people. And sometimes we're like, oh, that person prays really good. I don't want to pray because that person prays really good. I mean, and it's like, and, and honestly, I don't think that that person in, the heart, in their heart is praying in a way to get prestige, but sometimes in our hearts, we give them prestige for praying well, right? Like, I'm a uh, 10 out of 10 prayer, okay? <laughs> I'm just kidding. I, I stumble over my words, I, but, but we're just talking to God, um, and I totally got off topic, and now I'm a little lost. Um, but um, even, even though like, we can kind of do this in the church, this happened, this, this opportunity was so much greater in Israel because prayer was a part of daily life. And it was a little bit more formalized. 
They had certain prayers that were prescribed for daily use. Uh, they would pray, pray a prayer called the Shema every morning and every evening. It had to be said as early as possible. They would say, it's like, well, as soon as you can see the, dis- the, 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 the distinguishment from the sky and the ground, pray that prayer as soon as light's visible. But it had to be said before 9 a.m. That prayer had to be said before 9 a.m. So teenagers, out of luck, Right? <laughs> And it had, to be say, it had to be said in the evening before 9 p.m. And, there were, and honestly, there were people who prayed this reverently, but for most, it was kind of like a recitation. And they had other prayers uh, where they had to repeat daily. And there was a, a prayer called, basically it means the 18, because it was 18 prayers. It can still be heard in some synagogues. Um, and it, let me be clear again, at the heart of this, there's nothing wrong with it. A society built on prayer. That's awesome. We're not condemning the prayer or their methods, but there's 18 memorized prayers, and just to give you one of the shorter examples, the fifth prayer went like this. Bring us back to the, thy law, O our Father. Bring us back, O King, to thy service. Bring us back to thee by true repentance. Praised be thou, or O Lord, who dost accept our repentance. And so Jewish law stated that the Jews had to recite these three times a day, these 18 prayers, in the morning, in the afternoon, and the evening. Not only that, but they had stated prayers for every occasion in life. They had prayers before and after meals when you saw lightning or fire, uh, when there was a new moon, comets, rain, right? We've been praying a lot down here. Storms, you prayed when you entered a city, when you left a city, when they saw the sea, right? Prayers for everything. Um, Again, if only we prayed so much. Right? And I'm not, I'm not down in their prayer. But there is always a danger, uh, especially when the prayers, I think, are like pre-written, especially by someone else, that you're just like reciting things. That, that you, they're just saying things and they have very little meaning. Right? It's just coming out. You're just doing what you're supposed to do. And for many, they just became lines people said. Right? And because they had to say them so often, it would lend itself to people stopping wherever they were and praying. Right? Like 8.55, you could stop and they would sometimes pray really, uh, they would be very demonstrative, uh, lift their hands up, you know, head down, you know, and be like, Lord, you know, whatever in the middle of, and nowadays we'd, we'd call the coppers and we'd be like, I think we got a Baker Act here. Um, if you could come check this guy out, I think something's going on. They're, they're praying in the streets with their hands up. But there they'd be like, what a holy person in the middle of Publix, just got to pray to God, Right? They'd be like, that person is so holy and amazing, right? Because people realized, man, okay, have you ever done something and you're like, man, this, re- this is registering a positive reaction. I'm going to keep doing it, right? I'm just going to keep doing it. And so people would intentionally, you know, maybe the first time it's an accident and you're like, man, I'm going to go out in the streets now. I'm going to pray out in the streets because it's really getting me a good reputation for holiness. And then it, and then it kind of became not about talking to God, but being seen, and, and honestly, if we think about the heart of it, it's using God to impress people. Using God just to impress people. And, and when it's like that, who's your God? If you're using him to gain something else. Have you ever had a friend, um, and I hope not, because this would really hurt. Have you ever had a friend who like um, would be really friendly with you and obviously this probably happens mostly in high school, but would be really friendly with you and were like really good friends with you. But then if another person was around who didn't like you so much, they kind of laid back and they wouldn't, wouldn't talk to you so much. They wouldn't act like they knew you. Has that ever happened to you? All right, we're going to go by everyone name that person. <laughs> no, but it doesn't feel good. And what, what, what's revealed is that person's not really my friend. If they won't be my, they're my friend because that person has said they can't be, or that person doesn't like me, and so they're friendly when that person's not around, but when that person can see or finds out they totally abandon relationship with me, that person's not your friend. Now look at our relationship with God. Are we friends with him always? Or are we friends with him when we are around approving people? People who will say, that's awesome, man. That person loves God, and I love God. I respect them. But then when we're out in the world, we're like, well, yeah, I don't really want to talk about it. You know, I'm kind of like, I'm kind of doing that like quiet, 
quiet evangelism thing um, where I don't tell anyone or act like it, but like miraculously people are like, are you a Christian? I'm like, yes. You want to say the prayer of salvation? They're like, yes, I do. And you're like, praise God. <laughs> right? Right? If that works, tell me. I'll try it. Um, but it's a similar act. It's, it's displaying... It's displaying relationships or hiding relationships based solely on what the people around will think. And when we don't think of it in terms of God, we can see the falseness in that relationship. If we're only demonstrating Christian behavior or love for God when we're with Christians and we pull back or revert to other behaviors when we're with others who don't see it in a positive light, then what are we? We're, we're just blown by the wind. We're just blown by the wind. We're fickle. We're fickle. We're fickle. And really, it's fearing man rather than fearing God. You can't serve two masters. It's man or God. And it shows lack of relationship. And God wants intimate relationship. He wants intimate relationship. In fact, I'm not just making all this up. He says it. Say, Jesus says, if you deny me before man, I will deny you before my Father. In another passage, he says, depart from me. I never knew you. He's very serious about this relationship because he is giving himself to us. All of it. He doesn't, he doesn't deny us relationship. He would say, he says, this is my, this is my son. This is my daughter. I'm like, that person? Yeah. I adopted them. I paid for them with my blood. That's my son. That's my daughter. He is proud of us. How much more should we be proud of him? He, and, and as we're talking about prayer, do we desire to pray and talk to God when no one else can see? That whole in the closet thing. Like, how often do we go pray quietly where no one can see? Or, or, or are we only, and I'm not saying we despise prayer, but are we only talked into praying when it's like public or when we're at church and said, oh, let's pray? Or like, hey, can you pray? Or hey, we're going to pray for this person. Let's all pray together. And we like close our eyes and, and don't see anything. Or do we actually go in and talk to, that, to God on our own? How often do we do this? And I'm just trying to demonstrate to you. I'm not trying to make everyone feel bad. I'm trying to demonstrate, and this is what Jesus is trying to do, get people demonstrate. I don't want these, these pre-prayer recitations that you're doing. I just want to talk to you. I just want you to talk to me. I just want it to be real. I want there to be relationship. I want sincerity in our relationship. And so Jesus gives an example of how to pray in the Lord's Prayer, and we're going to delve into that a little next week because that's its own sermon. Um, so... But he wants our prayer to be sincere. And it can be simple, but sincere. And then Jesus moves on to fasting. And when we talk about fasting, we have to keep, keep in our minds that Jesus, when he's, when he's talking about these things, when he's talking about what he sees wrong with the generosity of the people, when he's talking about what he sees wrong with the prayers of the people, and when Jesus is talking about what he sees wrong in the fasting of the people, he's talking about things that he is seeing. He's talking about things he is seeing around him that he has a problem with. They're present, right? And, and he's not, and we have to remember too, that he's not calling out, um, he's not calling out the world. He's calling out the Israelites. He's calling out his people. That's who he's calling out. He's basically calling out the church. And so I wonder, what would Jesus, if he came, what would he correct in the church today? I'm sure there'd be some corrections. They wrote letters in Revelation for us that we can look and say, man, let's make sure we're not doing that. But what would Jesus correct in the church today? Things that he would see with his own eyes that he would see in the church on a daily basis? Would there be a huge gap? And that's really, man, that's why I want to go through this Bible, this Bible thing, to see what is Jesus saying and what are we doing? Is there a huge gap? Like people talking about the church dying, but the church isn't building, it's, it's people. So when it's say, saying the church is dying, it's saying people are not 
coming to Jesus and people are not living the Christian life. People are not finding Christ and being set free in Christ. Why is that? And it's not a problem with our program. It's a problem with our hearts as individuals. It's a problem with how well or how closely we follow. And so he dresses, addresses what he is seeing people do when they're fasting. And for the Jews, let's keep in mind, fasting is food. It was always food. I'm not saying we shouldn't fast social media or whatever, but we, we rarely fast as it's described in the Bible. There's something entirely different about fasting something that you really kind of don't need in the first place versus something that you need to survive. Fasting food is like I'm giving up something I need to survive, right? It's a little bit different. And, and if honestly, if it's more difficult for you to give up like TikTok or Instagram or Facebook than food, that's called addiction. So just so you know, uh, there's a 12-step program for it. Um, and fasting um, isn't about, uh, often it's like, it's kind of funny, and I'm not, I'm not saying social media is a sin, I'm, I'm moving on to the next topic, but um, it's kind of funny because often when we fast something for like Lent or whatever, they're like, we're basically like, I'm going to give up something that's a sin, <laughs> you know? Like you, you often see in like movies, there's like this one movie that's like, um, that I didn't see, but one of my pagan friends saw. That's like, that's like the guy's like, hey, I'm, um, I, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, it's Lent, so I'm giving up premarital sex for 40 days. And I'm like, good for you, buddy. I'm sure God is super pleased with you, right? <laughs> it's not about giving up sin for a time or giving up something we enjoy for a time, right? It's about giving up something that's far more important, something we need to survive, food. And I think sometimes we just cheapen it because it's easier to give up social media, than a week than it is to not eat. And I'm not saying don't eat for a week. There's like ways to do it. Um, so Jewish fasting is about food and it lasted from dawn to sunset. And outside that time, normal meals could be eaten. Uh, but there was only one fast that, that they had to do, which was the day of atonement. And on that day from morning to e evening, people had to deny themselves. And in the scribal law, that's not the Bible, it's what the scribes said, this is what that means, um, when sometimes they were wrong, but it meant like no eating, no drinking, no bathing, which I don't think that's what God intended. I can't go a day without a shower. Um, it's good for everybody. Um, it, there was no anointing yourself, so you couldn't do that like you do daily, I know. Um, you couldn't wear sandals, which also means Crocs, so... That's awful, right? Um, or you couldn't have intercourse, which I just want to say I'm really glad that we have the uh, third through sixth grade in here today. You can ask your parents. Um, so they would train their kids in some measure of fasting so that they could do this national fast when they grew, grew up. Um, and, there were, and there were other reasons for private fasting. These were like the, the Israelite, this is why you fast, this is when you fast. But there's also like some private fasting. One fast was connected with mourning where they wouldn't have meat or wine between the time of death and burial. And there was fasting to make amends for some sin, um, both personally and in the case of national sin. And we see this often in the Bible. They fasted after civil wars. Samuel has the people fast after they followed Baal. Nehemiah made the people fast and confess their sins when they went back to Israel. It was also fast that there, there's also fasts that were designed to get revelation from God, to prepare for revelation from God. We see this Moses fasted for 40 days and 40 nights on the mountain uh, to receive revelation. Daniel fasted as he waited on a word from the Lord, and he was very prophetic. If you've read that book and seen his testimony concerning the kings there, he was filled with revelation. But also, the nation would fast in times of like drought or like other serious national emergencies. The harvest isn't happening. There's about to be a war. Let's, as a people, all together, come together and fast. And it was like meant to like, let's draw God's eyes to this situation. Let's show him as a nation that we are, are committed and we want revelation. We want to know what they're seeking revelation. I, we want to know what to do. We want to know what we should do. Lord, tell us. And some fasting was done on behalf of others. And I think this is the type of fasting, like if you're fasting for personal sin, it's always better. Someone's like, oh, why are you fasting? Like, well, you know, you'd be like, oh, I'm fasting for them, you know, fasting for what they did, you know, just like I'm just praying for them hardcore. And I think that honestly, this is probably um, most of the fasting where this is occurring, 
right? Where Jesus is saying, because like how many people are like, he's like, oh, you want everyone to see you fasting. Like if you're like fasting every day for sin, they were like, I mean, how can that person be like, man, that person's so righteous. You're like, man, you messed up again, bro. You're still fasting. Why is your face all like that? Yeah, you're running out of clothes, man. You're tearing your clothes every day, right? Like, I'm like, yeah, I know I'm trying, you know? I'm like, what's the problem? Be like, I just can't get up for that 9 a.m. prayer thing, man. It's like too early. I stay up till four o'clock. We're playing some video games, and then you know, nine o'clock just rolls around, you know. Um, but I think I think this is an attitude of like when you're fasting for other people, it's like because they can't do it for themselves, they don't realize their sin. I've uh, I've noticed a lot of things with them that they need to change, and I've talked to them about it, and uh, they're not doing it, and so I'm fasting for them until they change because they're in a lot of sin. And I'm praying for them. I have that so memorized because I do that all the time. I say that. I'm just kidding. But it, like, it, it makes it seem like you're really disciplined and you're really holy and everyone else is not. You know, you, even if you're like, you're like fasting for the nation, but you're, you're like full of sin, you know, and I'm just like, I'm just, I'm just fasting for our nation because they're not really, you know, I'm really spiritual. And there's nothing wrong with fasting for the nation. There's nothing wrong. Well, again, but it was the motivation why these people were doing this. Right? And so some of, some of the, the priests and scribes would be like, well, the common man can't fast. They're just incapable of the discipline it requires. But I can, and so I will, right? And you can see that how that might bring glory to yourself, right? Because you wouldn't want everyone to know if you're fasting in penitence for some hidden sin. You wouldn't, wouldn't want to draw attention to your own shortcomings. But like even this caused problems because um, let's say everyone knew that you were in sin. Like, let's just say you were going to do something for personal sin. Another way this caused problems was, okay, I did something. It's not hidden sin. Everybody knows I did it, right? So then I fast, right? And I'm all like, oh, making myself look all, because it wasn't about fasting. It was like, you know, looking miserable. And like, you know those people that like when they're sick, they're just like, oh, I'm dying. And you're like, what do you have? The cold that I had last week and worked all week, you have that same cold and now you're dying, right? <laughs> Women, you know, husbands, right? Is that, <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Just want to start fights. Um, I tell Daisy, I'm like, you don't know my immune system. My immune system is weak. I must lay down. Um, I'm just kidding. I'm not that person. Other people are, not me. Um, so anyway, um, <laughs> I just start talking, and I'm like, what am I doing again? Oh, yeah, sermon. Um, but let's say everyone knew you were in sin, then you could fast and make a show of it without actually being repentant. And then everyone thinks, oh, man, that guy's repenting. That guy, that guy knew he was in sin, and he did it, and the whole nation can see. The whole nation can see that he has turned it around, and he loves God. And so you could do this outward thing to show people, yeah, I'm sorry, but without, without actually repenting, and there being no repentance on the inside. It was only appearing to be repentant. And so people would look all disheveled, and in some cases, they would like deliberately whiten their faces to look paler than they are, right? So young ones, if you want to get out of going to school, you whiten your face a little bit, and you're like, and they're like you're so pale, you're not going to school, right? Um, and then mom's like, yeah, they are, because they're not staying with me all day, dad. Um, so it just happened, um, another thing that happened was like Jewish fasting days were typically Monday and Tuesday, and so were market days, right? So there's a really good opportunity to go out down to the market on the busiest day so that everyone could see you in all your holy glory, disheveled and fasting, and you could be the talk of the town, right? And it's funny how we can take something that's meant to display humility and turn it into something to be prideful about. This was the world's first humble brag, was, was the fasting, and Jesus says, wash your face. Stop looking so somber, you hypocrites. Does God not know if you love him? Does he not? You're not fooling him. Does he not know your hearts? Does God not know our hearts? And I often think about this um, because we, we, we say this prayer, right, um, that where we accept Jesus into our hearts and we give our lives to him. And we're like, good, forever. I'm like, Lord, you have my life. Um, I'm accepting you into my heart. Um, but saying you give your life to him is not the same as giving your life to him. Sometimes it's a very similar thing where we make a public display for people to see, but we're not actually giving our lives to him. And we can do it for the same reason. Sometimes this is said, this prayer is like a duty, right? Like we have to. 
um, mom and dad are like, hey, are you going to be saved? And you're all like, yes, because I'm seven and I can't say no, right? And so we say this prayer. We get baptized because that's the next step. And often you find that a lot of people, as they get older, that are Christian, they're like, I want to get baptized again. I did that because I was like, the first time, I don't even, I mean, I knew what I was doing and I wanted to do it. But this time, my heart's like, man, I'm doing this for me. I want to do this, right? And so, or, or sometimes just because we want to go to heaven rather than what was meant in the Bible of like, I'm giving you my life. This is the beginning of a new life. Uh, this is a new birth. I'm starting over. I'm giving this life over to yours, over to you. God, I'm yours forever. Everything I am, everything I have, all that I do is for your glory. And we can look back on others and like looking, we're talking about things they did and mistakes that they made and how it, they kind of got off base. And we can look back and scoff, but I think we just kind of make the same mistakes in new forms. We can take things and, and, and work our way around it. The devil's got new tricks. The complications come in following God when we are trying to work around him. It's easy to follow God. Following God is simple. We get in the word. We seek his heart. We want to know what he says so that we can do it. And as we continually read the word and get to know him, we learn more to do and he draws us closer and it becomes easier. We just want to know where he's leading so that we can follow. And God, in all of this, wants to reward us. Is that not crazy that Jesus even talks about reward? I mean, God could just be like, do it because I'm holy and I made you and just do it for that reason. You know, the old, like, he could just, they'd be like, why are we doing this? Because I said so. And I wrote it down. Read it. Know it. Right? Like, you can write this book for your kids. And they're like, hey, why am I in trouble? Be like, well, it's actually on page two of mother's book that says you will be in trouble for these things. Right? He could just say that. And he says, I'm going to reward you for things done in secret. How often have you guys done something around the house or at work? You just do it in secret. It's something that's meant to be done. You, you do stuff for other people and you never complain and you never say, uh, am I going to get my due? Right? It's just something that you do. And you, and you weren't seeking rewards. You're just doing it. Right? You just do what needs to be done. Never bringing attention to it. How often are you rewarded for those secret things? Never. You're never. Often you don't even get a thank you, right? That's how you're never rewarded. And it says God sees those things and rewards us for those things. The secret things nobody knows that you do, the small tasks they do for others. It says God sees those things and wants to reward us. Why, and why else would Jesus bother speaking in terms of reward? Unless these rewards are real. And instead of God saying, do this, because I'm telling you to, it says God will reward you if you do what he says. And again, that doesn't mean money. It means something better. Because what happened for Moses? What happened for Daniel? What did they get? They got revelation from God. The more they obeyed and the closer they got, and Moses saw God passing by. People heard his audible voice. Do we want revelation from God? And do we sincerely, in our hearts, would that be the ultimate reward? To hear from God. Because if our hearts are for God as he wants, that is the ultimate reward reward to have revelation from God. I want revelation from God. I want to hear from God. I want to hear from God. I want to know his thoughts. I want to know his ways. I, I want to be pleasing to God. I, I want to make sure everything that we do is pleasing to God. And if we want more of God, if we want revelation, which he wants to give us, isn't it so cool that God wants to reward us? He wants to speak to us. He wants to give us more of himself. Like he just wants to do good things for us. He wants to be in relationship with us. He wants it more than us. And it all, we are the one who get all the rewards for it. We're the ones who get all the benefits from it. We're the ones that, all, that get all the blessings from it. And it is his heart to give it to us. And it's his heart to draw us closer. And we are the ones that keep ourselves from being in this situation. We're the ones who keep ourselves from doing it. And yet still, he's like, I still, I still want to draw you close. I still want to bless you. I still want to speak to you. I still want to give you revelation. 
And it's there. If we want more of God, we just have to be faithful in these little things. We just have to be sincere about our relationship with him and sincerely seek him and do the things he's called us to do for the right reasons, which are because we love him and we want to please him. And that's his heart for us. He does things for us because he loves us. He's not asking us to treat him better than he treats us. And he's God. And he's just asking for the same thing that he's giving. He works for our good because he loves us. He is always there to hear our prayers and our cries because he loves us. He always wants to hear our voice. He wants to speak with us in the still and in the quiet places. Do we want that of him? We want to speak to him. Do we want to hear from him? But it's so easy. He just wants relationship. He just wants relationship. He's made it so simple for us to be in relationship with him. And it's all he wants. And as the people of God, I want to get this right. I want to get this right. Because we cannot go out and do works for God without knowing God. We can't go show people the love of God without knowing the love of God. And the only way we know the love of God is by being with him. By, by wanting to speak with him. By wanting to sincerely give our lives to him. Completely. So as Christians, we need to make sure, we need to examine our hearts and make sure that our hearts are his. Completely. Lord, I just thank you that you give us your heart. I just thank you that you give us a relationship that we don't deserve, Lord. You are, you are too good for us. And yet you desire us, Lord. And I just pray, Lord, I just pray that we would have a desire in our hearts for you. That we would want nothing more than to please you. That when we say, Lord, I give you my life. I live for you alone. I, I, I am reborn. I am a, I am a new birth that we could mean it, that we could truly be sons and daughters of the living God, that we could treat you as our Father as you truly treat us as sons and daughters. Lord, I just pray for a revelation. Lord, I pray for everyone in this room that we would have a revelation of your love, that we would have a revelation of your grace, that we would have a revelation of your mercy. As, we, as we're going about our, our regular lives this week, that as, as we make mistakes, Lord, or as we, as we, as we seek you, or as we, and as we fail sometimes, Lord, that we would get a revelation of what your grace looks like and what your mercy looks like, that we would get a revelation of your love, Lord, your undeniable love, your eternal love, and so that we can take that revelation and turn it around and give revelation to people about your grace and mercy and your love because we've experienced it. We've experienced it in a new way that we can understand, Lord, and I just pray that you would show us, whether it's simple or complex, whatever we need to see in whatever way we need to see it with our mind and our heart and our soul, Lord, I just pray that you would open them up so that we can have understanding when you give us revelation. And I pray for revelation this week for each one of us, Lord. I pray for revelation for the body of Christ. I just pray that we would seek you in our prayer lives. Lord, that we would seek your face, that we would seek to talk to you, Lord, that we can hear you speak back and have revelation of who you are. Lord, that we would truly, truly be the temple of the living God, Lord. I just pray that you move in us and move through us, Lord. We love you and we thank you and we praise you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Mm -hmm.